But today, two weeks ago, we started a series this, two things I know to be true. Two things I know to be true. Actually, I, I really want to finish today to see what we're going to be doing next week. Here's a recap real quickly if you didn't, weren't here two weeks ago. Uh, to uh, believe and to believe in something must be based upon something that is true. Now, I know a lot of people that base what they believe on something that's false. And if you base something that's, on, if, if you base what you believe on something that's false, eventually the wheels are going to come off, just so you know. But those who believe in what is true, that is where true belief is from. And what is true? True has been tested. Truth has been unchangeable. Truth is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I've been working with young people for almost 40 years now. I have seen a change in our society. I see what people think that kids need today and what they needed 40 years ago. And I can honestly tell you, what they needed 40 years ago is still what they need today. They need Jesus Christ, first of all. They need truth to be delivered to their hearts with love and compassion. They need boundaries. They need guidelines. They need standards. Because without them, they'll, they'll, they'll never thrive. Never, never, ever will they thrive. Truth is based on something that has been tested. Scripture is full of man's journey. Of man's journey, man's failures, man's success. But most of all, man trying to get to know God and God's desire for, for man to know him. Folks, I'm telling you, God wants to know you. God wants you to know him. Not just in a, 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 in a religious type setting, not just in a traditional type setting, but God desires for each and every one of us to be known by him and for him to know us. Romans chapter 4, 17 is the scripture that I started out with two weeks ago. It reads as this. As it is written, I have made you a father over many nations. Talking about Abraham. He is our father, our physical father, Abraham, the father of many nations. In the sight of God, in whom he believed two things to be true. One, he believes that God gives life to the dead. And number two, he believed that God calls things that are not as though they are. We serve an amazing God. We serve a loving, caring, unbelievable master of heaven. We serve him. He does not serve us. We serve him with our life, with our body, with our soul and our spirit. But these two things, God gives life to the dead. And God calls things that aren't as though they are. In Romans 4, 18, it says, as Abraham against all hope, Abraham in hope. So it was against all hope, but yet in hope he believed. And so the father of many nations, just as it has been said to him, so shall your offsprings be. His wife was so old beyond the point of being in the natural, being able to conceive children, but God gave him a promise. Folks, God gives promises to people we become the impatient ones that it's not done on our timetable. We think it should be done, done, done. Uh, and I've said this before, way back when, when you have to put a baked potato in an oven and you wait, what, two and a half hours at 400 degrees. Now you can put a baked potato in a microwave, put it on high, and what, it's three, four minutes before it blows up. And sometimes we're standing in front of that microwave going, why does it take so long? Why? Remember dial up? Remember dial up? You could still hear the sound and you'd sit there and if you had poor connections, that maybe, that whatever that sound was, it would go on forever. And we're like, wow, look how fast this is. This is amazing. I'm connecting to the, what, that thing called the World Wide Web. I don't think it'll ever catch on, but I'm connecting to it. And then we went to DSL, then we went to this, and then we went to that. And now it's like well, you, you carry it in your pocket. And we're still like, why does it take so long? I need to order a cheeseburger for Uber, Uber, Uber Eats. U Uber Eats. Yeah, we're so lazy, we can't even, we have them delivering McDonald's to our door. And wait, just help me understand. You pay for that, right? You pay for people to bring you McDonald's food. Okay, put a little money aside for a cardiologist because you're, you're sitting on your rear end and you're eating McDonald's food. So I'm just saying, 
maybe put a little bit aside. But Abraham's wife, she was beyond the years, but Abraham had hope. He had a promise. Folks, you know what's happening in Christianity? We're not praying for God's promises. Pray for God's promise. The Bible is full of God's promise. It says to raise up your children the way they should go, and when they're old, they'll not depart from it. That's a promise. You pray and believe with all of your heart. But my kid's wayward. You pray and believe with all your heart. It's a promise. Abraham believed in hope. And we know that hope comes out of a process. This is the last scripture I believe I shared with you. It was Romans chapter 5, verse number 3 and 4. It says this. We know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. That's where hope comes from. It comes from testing. It comes from believing. It comes from perseverance. Perseverance builds character. What is character? Character is who you are defined as a group or individual. It is who you are when you're all alone. That's your character. Oh, you can have character in front of people. You can have character in front of people. But it is who you are when you're all alone. That's your character. What's your mind filled with? What's your heart filled with? What's your life filled with? What's your character? Well, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. See, it chips off. It breaks off. If you've ever laid any kind of block or brick or whatever, and you've got to make a block fit, believe me, you're going to take that side of that trowel, and you're going to whack on that brick, or you're going to take a brick hammer, and you're going to whack on that brick until that piece busts off, and then you're going to stick it in because it fits perfect. That's exactly what, uh, what suffering produces perseverance, which produces character, which produces hope. You've got to allow God to take a chisel to you, man. You've got to allow God to take a hammer to you. God allow God to take a jackhammer to you. Whatever it is, you got to allow God that opportunity because that builds hope. Romans 5.5 5 says this, hope does not disappoint. I love that part. Hope doesn't disappoint. It doesn't disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. I've talked about the Holy Spirit many times. The Holy Spirit's gotten a bad rap, maybe because we call it a spirit, maybe because we call it the Holy Ghost, maybe because we think it's woo, 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 woo. People run away from that, but the Holy Spirit is the third part of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that when Jesus Christ left, he goes, I will send my spirit to be your comforter. I will send my spirit as a guarantee to you that he will indwell within you, your heart and your life. You need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to direct your life, to fill your life, to guide your life, to show you truth, to give you discernment, to give you understanding. That's what he says right here. God poured out his love into our hearts by his Holy Spirit. So if you don't want the Holy Spirit, you might as well just put the lid on your bucket because you, God can't pour in the Holy Spirit into your life if you don't want it. Yeah, but I don't want to be walking around and all of a sudden just fall on my face before God and start, ah, because the Holy Spirit overtakes me. That's not how it works. It really isn't how it works. And you're laughing because, I, I get it, because people think that way. Like you, you get the gift of tongues. Well, I don't want that. What if I get the gift of tongues and I'm standing in the grocery line and all of a sudden it just takes over me? I just begin to speak in tongues. What, what, I don't want that. You really think that, that God would embarrass somebody like that? God is a God of honor and respect. But yet we deny the Holy Spirit because we're so afraid of it. But listen, listen to what he just said here. He has poured out the love into our Holy Spirit. And by the way, there's a bunch of different gifts of the Holy Spirit, by the way. But see, he pours out his Spirit into our life. Receive that. Receive that. Here's a little note I wrote. Our hearts are a receptacle for either God's love and purpose or for sin and destruction. It's your choice, my choice. Do you hear me? We got a receptacle in our heart. It's either going to be filled with God, his spirit, his love, his compassion, his mercy, and his grace. Or it's going to be filled with sin and destruction. The choice is ours. In fact, in Luke chapter 6, verse number 45, it says this is something interesting. Because if you're wondering, I wonder what my receptacle is filled with. I just wonder. It's been a while since I've looked in my receptacle. Luke chapter 6, verse number 45 says this, Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the heart, 
the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mouth kind of tells what's going on in the heart. I tell my wife every day that I love her. Every day. A bunch of times a day. You know why? Because it's there. I tell my kids. Well, one of them out of the three. <laughs> I tell all three of my kids I love them every day. You know why? Here. I tell my grandbabies. I even tell that little grand girl that's still baking in there until Tuesday. Or tomorrow. Or this afternoon. <laughs> that I love them. Why? Right here. I tell people about Jesus Christ. You know why? He's right here. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. When people say things, I stand back and go, hmm. Bible also says you'll know a tree by its fruit. So you take a step back and you evaluate and you go, wow, that's interesting. That's interesting. So what I can almost guess what their receptacle's full of. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now let me say this to you. If what's coming out of your mouth is a representation of your heart, and if you're sitting there go, no, it's not. I just say things. No, you say things because you're driven by your heart. Okay? Your heart, you're driven by your heart. Therefore, out of the abundance of the heart, it says in Luke, the mouth speaks. So if what's coming out of your mouth isn't uplifting, isn't glorifying God, is destructive, is tearing down, then I'm going to recommend something to you. You get on your knees before the Lord. I mean, you get on your knees before the Lord and you repent. And you ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit. To give you a new heart. Because yours is full of garbage. And he needs to purge that. And again, it's your choice, my choice, which one we choose to have. In Romans 8, 18, it says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. That's hope. That's our blessed hope. You, you think of the toughest situation you're facing or have faced in your life. It is nothing compared to the glory of God's grace, the glory of heaven. Yesterday, uh, Ray and Cindy, uh, Cindy's mom passed away about a year ago in September. Mary, awesome lady. Uh, I, her mom and dad came to church. Dad came to know Christ. Mom came to know Christ. It was, yeah, so yesterday we did a memorial service. It was great. Can we, it was a great time. I mean, it was sad, but it wasn't sad. It was, it was a great time, okay? It was a great time, you know, uh, talking about Mary in a good way. We all talked, everybody talked good about Mary. But I, I'm just saying that, but the, the, the thing was that a year ago, it was September 4th, 6th. September 6th last year, Mary breathed her last breath. And instantly, instantly, all the suffering that she had faced, especially in the last few years of her life because her, 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 her body was failing her so much, in a blink of an eye, faster than that, she was made brand new. Brand new. Brand spanking, fresh off the press new. And she stood before the Lord and heard these words. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Come on in. Take a rest. Take a load off. Come on in. See, that is the hope that he talks about. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that God will be revealed to us. The glory that will be revealed to us. God has revealed such glory to us through the form and through his son, Jesus Christ. And then in Romans 19 through 23, it just talks about struggles of this life, spiritual battles that we face, and that we wait, we wait for the return of Jesus Christ to come. Know this, Jesus Christ is our blessed hope. He is our, he's our anchor in the storm. He's our protection in the battle. He's the one that holds us when everybody else lets us go. He is the one. You know what I prayed today? I've been praying. It's been really been impressed. I'm going to tell you whatever. It's been on my heart all week. I've really been praying. God, don't let my words be persuasive. Let your spirit be persuasive. Because if I come up here and dazzle you, 
Now that's just, that, that's just hurtful. You know, Lysians could have said, you know, it's okay, Pastor. You, know, you laugh. That's why I love you and say you're honest. I could dazzle you with eloquent words, but then I remember, is it the Apostle Paul? He said, you know, we're not men of eloquent words, but we pray your Holy Spirit would take control. I'm going to be honest with you, God's dealing with some of you. God's dealing with you. You've been running. You've been hiding. You've been sitting. Whatever it's been, God's dealing with you. You need to know that. And I prayed all week long that God's spirit would touch your hearts and your lives. Because that's our hope. Romans 8.24 says this, And for in this hope we were saved. For in this hope we were saved. Remember what Abraham believed? He believed in the redemptive promise that he will raise the dead to life. And here in Romans 8.25 says, For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what we already have? But if we hope for what we don't already have, we wait patiently. We wait patiently. We wait patiently. If something's right before you, you have no hope. It's right there. I waited to marry, marry Chira for seven years. Seven years I waited to marry that girl. I had hope. I had hope. Sometimes my hope wavered, but I had hope. And on our wedding day, when I looked at her and she's standing there with that white dress thing on and, you know, the hat, and she had a hat on and, and uh, she had sparkly stuff like right here, uh, you know, and I just stood there and I, I, I was like, I'm about to take hold of my hope. My hope I had waited for with expectations and believe me, with great patience. But see, it, hope is nothing if we already have it. What is our hope? Our hope is Christ Jesus. Our hope is eternity with him. That's our hope. We hope in things, just, listen, just like Abraham did, he waited on future glory. He was promised a son. Promised a son, and he waited upon it. Romans 4, 17 says this. He calls things that aren't as though they were. That's something I love about God. He calls something that's not as though it was. So God says, it's not there, poop. The earth wasn't there. Solar system wasn't there. There was just this mass of nothing. And then one day he said, God said, I'm going to call the stars into being. There they were. And if you study astronomy and stuff, not astrology, which is of the devil. But if you study astronomy, you understand how each and every planet is perfectly aligned in their perfect path or else it would be absolute mass chaos. There was only a master planner that could do something like that, that could put all those stars in the sky, spinning on their certain axis and doing their rotations and keeping them all there in a perfect way that they don't all run into each other. Can you imagine if we would have made it? There would have been things bouncing off everything all day long. But he spoke it and then he goes, you know what, now I'm going to make earth. So he made earth. Just spoke it. He didn't have to take a little amino acid from Mars. He didn't have to find a little, little protoplasm thing from Uranus. That's a planet. Well, no longer it's not a planet, they, they, but it's still fun to say it. But anyway, so they, it, huh? It, is it they still, they still call Uranus a, a planet? Notice the mentality of this crew here. I say that, right? Like, <laughs> this is like junior high church. I love it. <laughs> but God didn't take something. He just said, I'm going to speak it. Boom. He goes, and you know what? I'm going to speak water. I'm going to speak air. I'm going to speak nitrogen and oxygen, iron, mercury, zinc. Well, he said potassium. I'm going to speak all this. There it is. It's spoken. Then I'm going to speak to plants. I'm going to speak to, to the sun. I'm going to speak to the moon. I'm going to speak to light. I'm going to speak to dark. I'm going to speak and make man. And then I'm going to t make man. Then I'm going to, t he's bored, so I'm going to make woman. I just speak it. That's who God is. Why, 
Why have we forgotten that? Why when we come into church do we forget who we're worshiping? You know why? Because we forget who our, where our hope is. Our hope isn't in me. Our hope isn't in a church. Our hope isn't in a tradition. Our hope is found in Jesus Christ. And right here it says in 4.17, Romans 4.17, he calls things that were not as though they are. And then verse, chapter 4, verse number 20 of Romans, it says this. Yet, 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 Abraham did not waver. He didn't see. He says, your wife is going to have a baby. His wife heard it, she laughed. <laughs> he ain't getting near me. Abraham's like, <laughs> okay. And then he waited. And he waited some more. And he waited some more. But yet it says here in verse 20, yet he did not waver. The King James Version for that word is stagger. He didn't even stagger, stumble. In his belief. He, it, didn't, it, it didn't matter. Because God promised him something. Why didn't he waver? I can tell you why. Turn to James chapter 1 verse number 6. I believe it's up there. Here's why. Even though James wasn't written to thousands of years after Abraham. But this is the belief system. This is how it works. This is how it is it's explained to us. James chapter 1, verse number 6 says this. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. So when you pray, you got to believe. When you ask, you got to believe. No doubt. But pastor, I have doubts. So do I. I'm going to be honest with you. Other pastors may not say it. I have doubts. There's times I pray. There's times when stress gets to me. There's times when, when things are on my heart and I doubt. I'm sorry. And I look to the Lord. I go, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But then I get right back at it. You know why? Because I have to pray without doubting. I have to pray and I have to believe. Now here's something. Have you ever been praying for something and while you're doing that, you're thinking, this isn't going to happen, but I'll just pray just in case. Anyone? I mean, you're praying about, it. oh, Lord, <laughs> whatever it is, I'm praying for it. I really don't believe it, but I'm praying for it anyway. We've all done it. We have all done it. But the Bible says when you pray, don't doubt. When you pray, you believe. As Abraham believed in the things that weren't as though they were. Pray for your family's salvation. Pray for your spouse's salvation. Pray for your kid's salvation. Pray for the job that God desires for you to be and then appreciate it. Funny. So, somebody a couple years ago had asked me, Pastor, please pray for me. Why? I need a job. Okay. Prayed. They got an interview. Not, not just, be, I'm not taking the credit for it. They just, you know, we agreed to pray. They got an interview. They got a job. Oh, oh it's great. It's great. Talk to him a couple years later. How's the job? I hate it. It's the worst job I've ever had. So I reminded them of something. I said, so the job that we prayed for, the job that God provided for you and blessed you with, the one that you asked for, you hate it. Whose fault's that? Just something to think about. But when we pray... We pray believing. Hebrews 10.23 says this. This is another reason why Abraham didn't waver. Hebrews 10.23 says this. Let's, let us hold unswervingly to the hope, to the hope, remember that hope, that we profess for he who promised is faithful. But here's the key to the hope what we profess. Go back to what Luke says. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the heart. The mouth speaks. So right here in Hebrews it says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. So what are you professing? People are like, God's never doing anything for me. And it just, this stuff comes out of them. Well, maybe it's because your receptacle is full of the wrong thing. It's something for us to look at it, each and every one of us. Believe me, I look at my receptacle an awful lot. 
And I check what comes out of my mouth because out of my mouth, my heart does speak. And right here it says, let us hold on swerving to the hope we profess. The hope we profess. You know what it means to profess, your, profess hope? It means to speak it. It means to act upon it. It means to share it. Why Christians fall off the Christian wagon, if you want to call it, is because they don't profess their faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, they profess it in church. This is safe space. This is safe space. This is, we're all Christians, or we look like them. This is safe. We'll profess our faith in here, but we don't profess it out there. Question, do your co-workers know you're a believer in Jesus Christ? Do your classmates know you're a believer in Jesus Christ? People that you work out with, do they know that you're a believer in Jesus Christ? People you go to school with, do they know you're a believer in Jesus Christ? Well, I don't have to walk around telling everybody, do I? Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. You answer the question. How do you profess it? Our little granddaughter, Adriana, she prays now for the meal. This is how she prays. Amen. <laughs> we have no idea what she just said. She could be praying for, I don't know, popsicles after. The, after. We, we don't know, but it's like, amen. We have to profess. If you don't profess, why? Do you believe that God can bring the dead to life? Do you believe that God sees things that aren't as though they were? Now back to Romans 4.20. Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God but was strengthened in his faith and gave God, gave glory to God. He did not waver in unbelief. Okay, so you can stand in unbelief. You can stand in it. And you're going to waver. Or you can stand in belief and grow. There's none of this. Because I'm not standing in anything. Except on the new carpet. I'm not standing in anything. Because there's nothing here. There is nothing here. There's unbelief here. And there's belief here. Where do you stand? And you can't, I'm going to be honest with you. Because I know it in my own life. You can't say, well, I'm just standing in the middle for right now. No, 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 no. No, no, no. There's no middle. There's none. Well, there has to be. Why? Well, there just has to be. No, there's no middle. There's nothing there. It's void. There's no purgatory. There's no do-over. You're either in unbelief or belief. You're in no faith or you're in faith. You're either professing, not professing, or you're professing. Either one. Either one. There's no, I'm working it out. You got to, I'm going to tell you what, there's, the Bible says to work out your salvation. I understand if you're saying you're working out and you're giving it your all, but you're standing in belief. It's funny, when we're in unbelief, it's so easy. We don't even have to work on it. We don't even have to work on it because it just comes natural to us. So the reason why Abraham did not sway is because he did not waver through unbelief. He didn't have unbelief in his life because he regarded the promise of God but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Why? Because the promise of God was the most important thing that he had. He had faith in him. If anything I could tell, I wish I could tell more people this all the time. Have faith in God. Don't have faith in a political party. Don't have faith in a government. Don't have faith in your retirement. You know, you know why we're, I'll be back. You know why I found out that, that retirement stuff, because the Bible doesn't talk about retiring. In fact, the Bible says to labor until he comes. Now granted, and I say this to school teachers, if you've been teaching 30, 35 years, those kids have sucked the life out of you. I, I get it. I get it. You can retire from that, but go do something else. The Bible says we're supposed to, we're not just supposed to go home and sit and wait to die. 
Okay, you're supposed to continue to, to, to work and you're also supposed to continue to share your faith. But anyway, do you know that retirement stuff happened, came out of Germany? Back in like the 1940-somethings when they thought, oh, what we'll do is we'll start this thing called retirement so that the older people will retire so that the younger people have a job to come into. I didn't know that. I read that in a book. No, I, I read a book. This, this, no, I did. This past week, I read a whole book. I had to for because I spoke to teachers on Friday. They asked if I'd read a book that they gave me. So I read a book. And it was talking about it. I'm like, what? This is what's in books? I didn't know this. So anyway, it talks about, so what we've done, we've taken on this mentality that we had, because they were talking about in the book how, I was like, it's a secular book. I don't remember the title because I never remember titles of the book except the Bible. The Bible is an easy one to remember. It says the Bible. Okay, but uh, the fact of the matter is that this book, it was a secular book, but they were talking about how when people just retire, they die. Oh, I'm going to work in my garage for the rest of my retirement. No, you're going to die in your garage because you're doing squat. You got to be productive. You got to put something into it. You got to, you got to go. And, and that, that's the truth. That's what Abraham, he wasn't, he wasn't, he, he wasn't like, oh, I'm too old. No, he was believing. And I wish I could tell more people that just believe in that God of promises. Romans 4, 21, and I'm going to get done. Romans 4.21 says this, and this is, this is awesome. Abraham being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Fully persuaded. Fully persuaded. I knew Dayton Chira for seven years. I could wear her down. I knew, I knew it. So I wore her down, got her at a weak spot, had that very romantic proposal. Proposals today are like off the charts. Romantic proposal was like, yo, you want to get married in between the commercial on TV? Are you being serious? Yeah. You seriously ask me? Yeah. Okay. I said, okay, you'll get married or what? Okay, I'll marry you. Cool. TV show came back on and off we went. It was, I, see, I, st I remember it today like it was yesterday. It just, it, it was that moving. Exactly. It just, I get choked up when I talk about it. But Abraham being fully persuaded. Ah, here's something to ask you. Are you fully persuaded? First of all, are you fully persuaded that Jesus Christ died for your sins? Are you fully persuaded? If you're like, oh, I think so, then guess what? You're not fully persuaded. Because if somebody tells me something else died for my sins, no one's changed my mind. Because I am fully persuaded Jesus Christ died for my sins. Are you fully persuaded that God loves you? I am. Because I know God loves me. Are you fully persuaded that God will lead you? I am. Because I've walked in his faith and I've watched him lead me. Are you fully persuaded? I mean, are you really fully, when, you, when you're fully persuaded, no one's going to sway you. No one is going to sway you. No one's going to knock you off your mark because you're fully persuaded. As Abraham was, he was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. I believe that God has promises. I I'm fully persuaded that God has, get this, the power to do so. He does. And my prayer, maybe this is why it's been, been like on my heart all week. My prayer is that you, Yins, will allow God's power. That you'll be fully persuaded that his power is able to do all that he has promised. Real faith is taking God at his word and believe in these two things that Abraham believed. One, that God raises the dead to life. God raises the dead to life. There are people in your life that are dead. Dead in their sin. Pray and believe. Pray and believe. Pray and believe. And be fully persuaded because people are going to say to you when they're found out you're praying for that person, what are you doing that for? 
they're not going to accept Christ. I, 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 I don't like when people say that stuff to me. I don't. In my younger days, I used to chase them. Knees are a little bad, so I just yell really loud, get away from me. Because I don't want what they have. It's like the flu. Ooh. Don't tell me that somebody I'm praying for can't come to know Christ. Now, they might die and go to hell. But I was fully persuaded in faith that God would save them. So if you got, pray and believe. And then the second part, calls things that were not as though they are. God's, God, God's got promises for your life. And he's calling things that aren't as though they were. We are to walk, what? Not by faith, or not by sight, but we are to walk by faith. You walk by faith for your family. You walk by faith in your finances. You walk by faith in your life, in your guidance, in your job, in your career, whatever it is. You walk not by sight, but you walk by faith. So these two things, he know for sure, we know for sure. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. And in that word, God, we find truth. Your word is true, it is powerful, it is effective, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And God, in faith, we pray, we pray in agreement, that Lord, that you will save people, that you'll set people free, you'll break addictions, you'll heal the wounded, you'll mend the brokenhearted, you'll provide jobs, you'll provide finances, you'll provide the promises. Whatever it is, God, we will stand holding on to you without staggering. Because, God, we believe in your power. I thank you for your power. And Holy Spirit, right now, pour into lives today. Change hearts as people reflect upon their receptacles. I pray, God, that they would see the condition of their heart. And, Lord, if they need to repent, now is the time. With every head bowed, I, I close just for a moment. I want to ask this question. It's twofold. One. If you need Christ in your life, if you need the beginning of your journey in Christ, I want to pray for you. And I'm going to stay put. You're going to stay put. In a moment, I'll ask you to look at me. The second thing is, if you're looking at the receptacle of your heart, or if you have, and you're finding that what out of your mouth comes the heart speaks, and you need a change, I want to pray for you. If you are swerving, if you are staggering because your faith is weak, I want to pray for you. So it's a wide assortment of things, but I want, more importantly, God wants to see you prosper. God wants to see you victorious. God wants to see your life changed. On my right, you want to pray any of those? Look at me right now. Yep, got them. Cool, okay. Got them. Got them. My left. Sure. Okay, cool. Pray this from your heart. Lord, here I am. You know me. I'm sorry. I'm really, really sorry. God, my life hasn't been all that it should. I've shut you out. I've put you aside. But Lord Jesus, here I am. I confess my sin and failure to you. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would come into my life, change me, shape me, Mold me, recreate me into your image. For Lord, I desire to hang on to your promise and to be filled with your power. Pour your Holy Spirit into my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Why don't you all stand? If you would like prayer this morning,